topic, as you can see, is how does the school's policies, procedures, and provision support pupils at risk of exclusion. And I'm only going to ask for like four bits of participation from you, and they're going to happen right now. Um, what I want you to do is going to throw numbers at me when I ask you a question. How much more likely do you think a boy is to be excluded from school than a girl? Any kind of random numbers? 100%. 100% more like that. that. Three, two, three. Yeah, it's three times more likely. So a boy is three times more likely to be excluded. Uh, if you're free school meals, how much more likely do you think you to be excluded than someone who's not free school meals? Five, two. Five, maybe. Anyone else? Four. Three and a half. So still pretty low. Uh, if you are SEN with a statement, how much more likely do you think you to be excluded than someone who's not SEN? Ten. Ten. Any advances eight. on ten? Eight. Any advances on eight or ten? Eight. So again, you're getting slightly higher. Eight times. You've seen a theme that's getting higher. SEN without statement, so action or action plus in the old model, how much more likely do you think you have to be excluded? 10. 10. Any advances on 10? 12. 12. It's 11. So if you're SEN, action plus or action, you're 11 times more likely. So you're the most at risk student. So when I did this research, I was basically looking to see if that kind of map, that profile matched who was being excluded from the school that I was at, um, and what they were doing to support those pupils specifically. Loads of words, um, we've just gone through it, okay, so three times more likely, eight times more likely, and so on. Um, basically, uh, Louise Gaisley, who's based here, if any of you don't know, she's been working with the Office of the Children's Commission, um, and she was very helpful in the research, she gave me some literature to look at. Um, her annex to the Office of the Children's Commission's report is really, really useful. It offers loads of advice to schools uh, on how they can help reduce exclusions, and I basically wanted to build on that in my research and see if the school that I was at uh, was, was working in that with those principles in mind. <coughs> Personal picture, I'm a bit different from the other two presenters. I'm on the PGC, just finished. Um, I took the SEN strand, which was run by Jackie. Um, so I spent six weeks at special school for people who have a statement of behavioral needs. Um, and I experienced kind of their responses to um, being excluded. They, they were resigned to the fact that they were failures um, and they felt that they just had no chance to succeed in life. So I kind of took that back to my mainstream school and I kind of wanted to see what we were doing to avoid that situation happening for different people. Um, and again, personal history, I come from an area where I saw a lot of deprivation, a lot of exclusion. Um, so I've seen that happen at home as well. So I've got kind of a broad picture of what happens when exclusion is in play. The school, really quickly, um, 1,700 students with 250 staff approximately. It was ranked as outstanding for behaviour by Austin a year ago, because we know that there are changes to the way they're going to be judged next time. Um, but I thought it was a really good model to see if they were doing something above and beyond that was going to help these young people. Um, the number of people with SEN is above national average. They're actually known to take more SEN people, so you'd expect higher rates of exclusion. Um, and they're, they're kind of broadly mixed between EAL and, and North British. I'll run through the literature review, but I'm not going to talk about any specific papers. As I said, I've got an annotated bibliography I can email to you uh, if you want anything from that. Okay. Um, basically, holistic, person centered approaches are more effective. So instead of creating a system that's going to match the whole pupils, you need to kind of target your support to each individual pupil to help them succeed, um, which is a big challenge with 1,700 pupils or whatever. Classroom practice is massively important to the success of an inclusive school. Most incidents of poor behaviour or challenging behaviour happen in the classroom, and most of them are avoidable, according to the literature I've looked at. So you're talking about language. If you're identifying a, a student as challenging or difficult before they even come into the classroom, you've already prejudiced their chances. If they've been labelled, as such, they'll feel that they have to live up to that reputation. And that becomes a culture as well as a function issue. Um, if you do have any questions, feel free to throw them at me while we go. Um, Leaving students as difficult, as I've just said, can have a negative impact both on the students and on the staff across the school. And the culture of the school is massively important. So consistently rewarding good behaviour and good practice is encouraged by lots of research, um, which we'll talk about again in a moment and successfully accommodating these people through the rewards and creating systems that are going to allow them to succeed uh, is, is very important. Again, rewarding expected behaviour and improvement in behaviour is effective, so you want to give them small steps to help these young people improve and feel success. Often the people that misbehave and are at risk of exclusion are those that don't experience success on a daily basis, and that's why they lash out when they have bad incidents. So giving them some really solid targets that can improve. And again, with the rewards, there is an issue over this. Uh, which a lot of schools report in research and so on school I looked at. It's difficult to secure the buy-in of all the students. So you can send letters home, you can send stickers, you can give them kind of sweets, pencils, pens to younger students if you get to kind of key stage from above. 
sometimes they don't engage because it feels beneath them. Um, and it's really a big challenge to try and engage them at that point at a really crucial moment of presentation. Briefly, the history of rewards. <laughs> uh, we start with Pavlov and his wonderful dogs. Um, I'm sure you've all heard this, I won't dwell on it. But again, the idea is that you can, by rewarding, um, by ringing a bell, you can get the dog to kind of salivate when they associate it with food. The same way if you dangle a carrot over a young person or an adult, they're going to work to get the carrot. Okay? And if you hit them with a stick, they're not going to do that behavior again. That happened around the turn in the 19th century, uh, 20th century. <coughs> As time went on, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs came along. Um, you've got physiological needs, so kind of like your food, your uh, warmth, water, and so on. Security, which is shelter, belongings to friends, family, and community, and then you get to self esteem and, and self realization. Interestingly, this model really matches Every Child Matters. If you compare the two, and what we're saying in Every Child Matters, which is now out, um, those, those needs were definitely within that documentation. That's been pushed aside a little bit. And as we get into the 1990s, Ed Desi and many others have talked about how rewards don't actually provide sustained improvement and they decrease motivation. So if you're rewarding people for good exam results uh, with whatever, they're less likely to enjoy their subject in the long term. Um, and it, it's interesting because the literature in, in, in inclusion basically says that its behaviour is not achievement or it's not motivation, so we do need things like this to help. So it could be attention, but it may not be. Withdrawal groups can be effective, but some say don't prejudice your in-class work. And communication with parents has got to be a key part of the process. If you don't engage the parents, uh, there's going to be a situation where you, you, you may find things you're putting in place in school aren't reinforced at home, and vice versa. So the young person's really not sure how to act. Okay. Right, literally done, so you guys the findings. Um, the research questions I had four. One is how do we actually identify these people? Uh, number two, what support is there? Number three, what does the school consider to be success? And number four, how successful is it on their measures? Okay. Um, it's important to recognise because I was a PGC student and there was a very short research period, I could only speak to staff and could speak to young people or anything like that. So it's very much the school's views. Um, this is the approach that I took. I looked at documentary analysis, so I looked at the policies and procedures that are on their system that are publicly available, and I looked at the amount of exclusions and so on that have been in place over the last three years. Um, I then had three semi-structured interviews with members of staff who I picked, so I proposed them. Um, I picked them because of their roles, so it was the person in charge of the inclusion unit of the school, um, someone else who worked in that unit, and then the assistant head who was in charge of the inclusion of the school. Um, and then finally, once I've interviewed them, I put them into like, I transcribed it, I looked at all the themes that were arising. Okay. Great. So we'll look at the statistics first. Um, up to April 2014 this year, there were 65 fixed term exclusions, so between one day and three days, um, which isn't bad for 1,700 students. And there were zero permanent exclusions, so they had not excluded anyone permanently. 34 students were involved in those exclusions. Okay. So, there were obviously cases of repeat offences, as it were. Um, 26 of the 34 students were male, which immediately corroborates this idea that three times more likely, it's in fact more than three times more likely than this. Yeah. Sorry, Andrew, can I just ask, mm. when you say up to April, was that from <coughs> September? September, right, April, yeah, yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, 26 out of 34 students were male, uh, 27 were SEN, so again, massive group male, and 27 white British, and that's more reflective of the ethnic makeup of the school. But as you can see, the statistics that are nationally born out this school. Two permanent exclusions in the three years prior to this research. So the national averages, this is where statistics become important. Show that 0.07% of the school population is permanently excluded. One student out of 1,700 is just below. So the school's actually below the amount of permanent exclusion. That's complicated, ignore it. But basically, they're doing better than national um, in terms of exclusions. Interviews. Now, the school identifies it through pupils at risk of exclusion through anecdotal evidence, so this pupil's doing this, they're a problem, or through statistical indicators. If you're being sent out of classrooms, then you know that's, that's an issue. Um, and they're published in a Turner report, an SLT look at that report, and basically check the data and decide who they're going to intervene with. Uh, what support is in place? Um, students who are identified go onto an on-site unit. So they go to a unit in the school, in the centre of the school, and they have a 12-week programme where they get skills, skills sessions, they get social sessions, and, and so on. And they also have a key worker who looks after them. So they have a key worker who they can touch base with every day. They use external provision, but every single person I interviewed, three, 
um, basically said that there is not enough external provision available in the local authority. So there are only nine spaces in all the different areas, so proves, um, vocational courses outside of the school, that they can access and get these students involved in. So the total for students, nine places, not really going to work if you're going to load the pump off. Um, what does the school consider to be successful? Um, the, basically, they want the on-site unit to engage these students and get them back into a classroom. So they don't want them out of the classroom for the long term, which goes back to Casey's point as well about not using the drawing groups to prejudice young people. Um, once that's done, they have a reintegration meeting and you want to have a reduction in behaviour incidents. So there's a clear statistical indicator. Um, member of SLT, we want them to be coping and achieving well and attending, which is a big thing for them. Uh, and the inclusion unit, remember the inclusion unit said basically a dip in the number of behaviour incidents. To secure the funding for the on-site unit, there has to be some kind of statistical indicator that is having impact, and I think is why that came out. Finally, how successful is it? We've talked about statistics, they're below national averages. Um, staff are generally happy with the low number of exclusions, but not all students are being successfully re-engaged. Um, the member of SLT said they don't fit the mould, so the idea that doesn't just, the students don't necessarily fit the system, and you can ask questions there about what they can do. Exclusion figures are great. And then, interestingly, the SL school member said that even one of those exclusions is debatable. And that's where the issue of research comes out. I was a PGC student, I didn't exactly understand why. Um, but he didn't think one of them made sense. Final bit of findings, and we'll start talking about recommendations. Um, on rewards, the school is aware that the reward system is poor. So there's a lot in, to do with sanctions, there's a lot to do with withdrawals, but there's not a lot in terms of actually helping these young people. Um, so they, they want to get something in place to help that. The school tries to communicate with parents, but they felt that the parents weren't necessarily engaging. But it'd be nice to speak to the parents and see if they thought the school was engaging. Um, and I asked the interviewers if they could pick one thing to change, what would they change about the school in terms of inclusion? The first one, the SLT, said they want really top notch education or vocational education available either on site or off site. So something that's going to engage these people that isn't going to uh, make them struggle academically. So, number two, develop our useful alternative provision. So again, try and find more spaces and secure more funding. And number three, have teachers work with it on a professional level. So there was a, a feeling amongst these members of staff that there may not be a culture of inclusion across the whole staff body, and it'd be good to do something to help them. Right. Uh, we've talked about that, so we'll skip that one. And this was for another presentation, so we'll start this here. This is what I recommended to the school, um, and these are the things that I think come out that it should be findings. First and foremost, you need to have a positive reward system, something that's going to help the young people. Um, and it has to be realistic, so you can't say all people should achieve a C plus in every subject you get, whatever. It should be tailored to each kind of student. So if you've got these students being withdrawn, <coughs> they have their own reward system. Continue to deliver excellent on-site provision, so they are on-site provision, they have a, a space to go to with staff. They need to carry on with that, basically, and refine this program. So they've got 12-week programs, but they haven't necessarily worked out what happens if they have two programs go in and they don't change their behaviour, so they need to continue to look at that. Number three, there aren't many links with other local schools, uh, as far as I was aware, or SLT were aware, so it'd be nice for them to share their practice with the schools not there to work together uh, to help inclusion. And finally, and this is a big one, invest time in training whole school staff in inclusive practice. So, as I say, the negative behaviour happens in classroom a lot of the time, um, if you can help staff learn how to approach that, that would be great. Okay. And that's pretty much it to be honest. The rest is research methods.